morning. Good. Good morning. 
Murray for a seat in the back, as usual. Uh, my name is Dr. Russ Bono. As it turns out, a weird uh, story I just want to tell you. I actually uh, met Dr. Margaret Fody and invited her here. And um, it was one of these stories that starts off something like this. <clears throat> so I walk into this bar and uh, actually hostess sat me down and uh, was actually waiting for my wife to meet me for lunch. It was a chicky and Pete's, not really a bar, kind of like. And I'm sitting there and the woman next to me is engaged with these two young women, uh, look like college kids to me. And I'm sipping my tequila and she's passionately describing to them telomeres and the function of telomeres. And as a geneticist myself, I'm sitting here thinking, well, what are the odds that I'm sitting here in a bar and the woman next to me is talking about telomeres? And she's really passionate about it. And of course, she's describing the work that wins the Nobel Prize by a woman. And I thought, well, I've got to introduce myself and say hello. And so the next thing you know, we're talking a little bit. We're both like nerds. And they were, it was your niece, yeah. a niece. And it was just hilarious the way it all unfolded. So I thought, well, who are you? Oh, you're the chief executive of some small group. What is it called again? I thought, oh, this is just too much of a coincidence. So we exchanged cards. We talked a bit. And I got her on the hook to get up at like 5.30 today and come out and give the 7 a.m. talk. So a proper introduction will follow, but I just want to say thank you to Margaret. It's a pleasure meeting you and talking telomeres over tequila, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Good morning, and uh, welcome to our medical education grand rounds. Um, so we have the honor of having Dr. Margaret Fody be our speaker. Uh, Dr. Fody is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for Cancer Research known as the AACR, which is the first cancer research organization in the world. Dr. Fodi received her Bachelor of Arts degree in political science at Temple University, and then went on to receive her master's and PhD in communications at Temple University School of Communications and Theater. Under Dr. Fodi's visionary leadership, the AACR membership uh, has grown exponentially from 3,000 to 42,000 members in 120 countries. In addition, the AACR's portfolio of peer-reviewed scientific journals has increased from one to eight. Dr. Fodi has been one of the most influential voices in advancing the field of cancer research, both in the US and abroad. She was elected president of three professional societies in scholarly publishing and cancer research. She has also served as a board member, committee member, and consultant to a number of other nonprofit organizations. Dr. Fodi has built a legacy of mentoring young women and minority scientists whose careers have been advanced as a result of her support. Under Dr. Fodi's leadership, the AACR has served with distinction as the scientific partner of Stand Up to Cancer. In addition, Dr. Fodi was instrumental in the production of the landmark AACR Cancer Progress Report 2011 and the equally impactful subsequent editions of the annual report, all of which celebrate the many ways that AACR, AACR members have made research count for cancer patients. Dr. Fodi's contributions have been widely recognized by many awards from organizations around the world. Her lengthy list of formal recognitions include honorary degrees in medicine and surgery from three universities in Italy and Spain. Today, Dr. Toad, Dr. Fodi will be presenting her talk titled, The Indispensable Role of Women in Biomedical Science, Healthcare, and Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fodi to the podium. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim, and thank you everybody for getting up early in the morning to talk with me. I, and thank you, Russell. It was a, a, a very special experience to uh, see you in Chickies and Pete's. And by the way, it was, it was for lunch, and there was no drinking at the time. Okay. Um, later, maybe not, but not at the time. Uh, so um, yeah, and I was also um, uh, reflecting on this uh, story that you told, Russell, because um, I was really concerned about telomeres and aging, and uh, as I'm still concerned. And, uh, 
my little great niece at 15 really doesn't care about that right now, but I thought she should know about it in the future. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's really exciting. I've not, never been to this beautiful um, institution and um, uh, thrilled to uh, speak on a subject that I'm um, very much, uh, very keen in. Um, uh, to try to push forward the, uh, uh, the role of women in science and medicine. So I have no financial uh, relationships to disclose. So thank you very much for the invitation, both uh, Jocelyn and Rose and Russell. I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to be here. And as I, um, as I uh, was thinking about uh, being here today, I was thinking about what a privilege it is uh, for me not only to be a woman uh, working in, in the area of cancer research and biomedical science, but also uh, through my own uh, position to be able to help support the careers of women who are on the front lines of patient care and public health. And so this is a very important subject uh, for any um, CEO of any organization, professional organization, and I know all of you uh, are members of uh, your own relevant organizations. Before I get started on my talk, I wanted to just just tell you just a couple of things about the uh, AACR, an organization for which I worked for, for many years. Um, our, our mission is to prevent and cure all cancers uh, through various mechanisms, research, education, uh, communication, collaboration, and, and increasingly funding for cancer research to bring in more uh, funding um, uh, to the field, and also science policy and advocacy, reali realizing that uh, uh, legislative issues are extremely important to any uh, biomedical science uh, area. And of course, we, our vision is to fundamentally change the face of cancer uh, by being the most effective catalyst for the prevention and cure of, of all cancers. Uh, I wanted to show you also a, just a quick snapshot of our membership because it is very big now. When I first started, we had 3,000 members. Um, we now have uh, over 46,000 members residing in 127 countries, representing uh, the whole spectrum of basic science all the way to the clinic and including population science. And, um, and of course, we also, in our strategic plan, uh, look very carefully at biomedical science before it reaches cancer research. And also, we go all the way to practice and are increasingly uh, working to um, really um, develop programs for uh, practicing oncologists who are not uh, scientists on a, on a daily basis. Uh, we have um, over uh, 20,200 uh, um, associate members who are the young investigators. We value them very much. They are the future of the field. Over 18% of our members work in the corporate sector, and 44% are now members of ACR. 26% are physicians or physician scientists, and 10% in underrepresented minority laboratory uh, scientists. So you can see we continue to grow. Actually, um, thanks to the work of our colleagues, uh, my colleagues, we have 245 mem uh, members of our staff, but it's almost like it's just growing um, so um, easily. Um, uh, the meetings are huge, 23,000 people, and everyone really wants to do something about this disease and attack it from various standpoints, a general biomedical science as well as engineering, mathematics, and all the new areas that are relevant to cancer research. So today I wanted to offer a perspective on the extraordinary contributions of women in biomedical science and medicine, uh, discuss the status of women in academic medicine, and the root causes, at least as they are uh, 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 in, uh, stated in uh, the literature of gender inequities. I'd like to talk a little bit about the vital role of mentors, sponsors, and organizations and institutions that will help in advancing the careers of women. And, and at the end, um, suggest some strategies to really maximize the accomplishments and the impact of women in any uh, field. So first of all, the important point to make is the professional success of women, um, biomedical scientists and physicians is absolutely essential for rapid progress. We know that, we want, this is why we, we're here today to talk about it. The contributions of women over time have been pivotal to advances in, in these areas of uh, translational research, patient care, overall public health. The data show that heterogeneous research teams that include individuals of diverse backgrounds, whether they be gender diverse or, um, or ethnically diverse, uh, are more innovative. They produce higher quality science and result in better outcomes. 
So therefore, the integration of women at all levels will really ensure that the workforce is very robust, will get something done, and will also uh, reflect the gender diversity of the pop populations it serves. So women in cancer science, the field that I work in, uh, have had a major impact on progress against this disease. Um, and although they uh, have come a long way in achieving their uh, uh, goals their, their, and, and having important roles in the cancer workforce, unfortunately, uh, their professional advancement and career opportunities have moved forward in a slow, inadequate, and inconsistent pace. The thing I wanted to mention today, since this is a diverse audience, is that there are many aspects that we know that are the, the impediments and obstacles, but there are many that we don't know yet, and we haven't known for many years, and we're still struggling to find out why this should be, because there is, uh, at this juncture, if not before, amazing uh, respect for women and their roles. So I wanted to just show you a, a slide that I've I've used in the past in talks like this to cancer people to show that there are enormous numbers of women rock stars in science and medicine, uh, past and present, who have really contributed in a very major way, not only to the biomedical science underpinning cancer research, but also cancer research in general. And, and what I think is fascinating is that when we think about these rock stars, um, it's not, the, the comments that have been made is it's not so much that, um, that we uh, don't have women making major contributions, it's that we don't know who they are frequently. And so organizations like ours really need to do a better job in underscoring uh, what is happening. I wanted to mention one particular, Susan Desmond Helmond, um, a former board member <coughs> of the ACR board amazing person, provost of, of uh, UC San Francisco, uh, president of Genentech, I'm going through her, her uh, background, and then more recently, the CEO of the, uh, the Gates Foundation, just having just stepped down just uh, last, uh, last month. Amazing to think about what she alone has been able to do in drug development, um, and in, in really in leadership in academia, and so there's a lot to, to really consider when we think about, again, the role of women the indispensable role of women in biomedical science, in all areas of biomedical science, and the stellar contributions that they have made to advances in cancer research. So I wanted to highlight a few, uh, for those of you who are very young and um, think that women only now are, are getting recognition, uh, when we look back on, in history, it's quite astounding, even uh, in, in my case, as I've been studying this for a long time, I think about <laughs> some of these women that are, I'm, I'm going to show you, uh, and the amazing fact that they managed to get recognition and even the Nobel Prize. For example, for example uh, Marie Curie. Now, um, she received the Nobel Prize in physics in, 19, in 1903, along with her husband Pierre and Henri Becquerel for their uh, work in radioactivity. She was the first woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in 1903, okay? But think about this. This was in a, um, this, thanks to the interception of a Swedish mathematician, Magnus Goesta Mittag Leffler, a male, who supported her being included in the prize because initially uh, there were to be only two, Henri and Pierre. So, you know, women need to think about how they need male mentors and male sponsors, and I will make that point in a couple of other slides. She was the first woman to become a professor at the University of Paris. She developed, uh, really, uh, uh, and discovered two elements, polonium and radium, for which she was honored a second Nobel Prize in 1911, and she was the first person, man or woman, to receive two Nobel Prizes and remains the only person to receive um, uh, Nobels in two separate areas. So when we think about her background, we say, wow, you know, of course she was absolutely stunningly brilliant, but there are so many other women who uh, need to be so recognized. When we think about uh, a woman by the name of Martha Tracy, MD, she was a founding member um, you know, of, of the ACR. Well, actually, her, uh, her colleague was a founding member, excuse me, and, and he was the father of immunotherapy. And today, when we think about immunotherapy being so hot, uh, in 1907, Coley was doing this work alongside of Martha Tracy and encouraged her to be the first female member of the ACR in 1908, the year after we were formed. Again, amazing for those of you who 
would look back and think about um, how early this was in the history of cancer research. Maud Sly, at the age of 34, presented a first paper by a woman at the ACR meeting, which was previously called American Society of Cancer Research. She was a director at the University of, of Chicago. Again, very amazing leading positions. Thelma Dunn, the first woman president of the ACR, elected six decades ago, okay? And uh, so it should be encouraging to the young women in the, women in the audience that these women uh, man managed to gain recognition very early on in our history. Unfortunately, her election as ACR president was not an immediate cultural breakthrough for no woman was elected ACR president between 1962 and 1975. And then we have Trudy Ellion, a woman I had the honor of serving early in my career, who was elected president in 1983-84 uh, for her amazing work and of course getting the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for having discovered about 19 different anti-cancer and antiviral agents that have saved countless lives from, uh, from various diseases. She too initially was thought to be just a technician because she didn't get her, her PhD. This DSC is an honorary degree. Thank, thanks to George, um, he brought her along and supported her and made sure that her accomplishments uh, were known by the world. So you see, it, you know, not every woman has, has, had, has uh, unfortunately had the fate of Rosalind Franklin. There are women who have been supported by men all along in the history of cancer research and biomedical science. We have Cook Wright, who is an outstanding scientist who made meritorious contributions as a minority physician. Also, uh, following in her father's footsteps um, in, the medical, um, in the medical world. And, uh, and Elizabeth Blackburn, another Nobel laureate who became president of the ACR, uh, the famous <laughs> telomeres person that um, uh, Russell was talking about. Um, and she um, has really now moved forward to really make sure that we know what cancer interception is, is all about, which is really to uh, think about early intervention at the pre-cancer early stage of cancer progression. So we have, um, and the thing, the important aspect of Elizabeth is that her mentee, Carol Greider, also received the Nobel Prize for her work. Very young woman. Um, uh, I'm not sure, we still don't know how much work Liz did versus Carol, but suffice it to say that, that uh, the two of those, along with Jack Sostock, really were honored appropriately. And, 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 and also contemporarily, we have Charpentier and Doudna, who really are globally celebrated for CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And this group we know is going, these two are definitely going to get the Nobel Prize and, and, and very soon for their collective work is amazing and has had extraordinary advances in biomedical science and cancer science in particular, um, already getting recognized all over the world. And a person I really like to cite is our President last year, Liz Jaffe, a world authority in cancer immunotherapy. She has a leading position at uh, Johns Hopkins, and uh, she has served as a co-chair of the NCI's Blue Ribbon Panel on uh, the National Cancer Moonshot Initiative. But perhaps um, important uh, to mention is that she was the first woman uh, to uh, serve as the chair of the National Cancer Advisory Board um, uh, starting in 2016, but, but what you need to know here is that um, that body has, is 49 years old. And so um, she has, uh, she's somebody that someone looks to not only for her amazing science in immunotherapy today, uh, but also because of her savviness in policy. We had 14 illustrious women presidents um, in, in our history, and the current one is a, is a major uh, figure in, in cancer genomics and precision medicine. Again, you can see that we're, we're stepping up the, the pace and having more women run for election and, and also uh, win the election. So uh, the evolution and impact um, of cancer research has been made possible by these remarkable women. And obviously, we need more women in leadership roles in biomedical science and medicine in order to uh, benefit um, uh, from all of their great work. So 
Let's look at medical schools uh, and how they have uh, shown gains in the diversity of applicants over time. You'll see from this slide that um, for the second time since 2004, more women than men have applied to United States medical schools. And as you know, women were the majority of matriculants to medical schools for the third year in a row uh, between 17 and 19. So the latest data show that things are going well. You see, the, see where they increased dramatically uh, very recently. And in light of these uh, impressive data of, of applicants to medical schools, what it means is we absolutely must keep these women in the saddle, keep them uh, contributing to, to medicine in a very important way, and, uh, and, and find out what these root causes are um, for dropouts, which we still are experiencing. There are gender diversities at uh, United States universities and abroad. Uh, I can tell you that um, people from Europe, women from Europe call me all the time and say, can you help me please? In Europe, it's worse than in the United States, they say. And you can see that as women progress through their careers, there are fewer and fewer women who are attaining professorship status, again, not sure why that is, but there are, it is multifactorial. There's a leaky pipeline uh, for women in leadership positions in science and medicine. You can see that in 2015, women earned 48% of the MD degrees and 55% of life science doctorates, but, but um, the percentage of women who were assistant professors declined to the level of 43%. Uh, 33 percent associate professors and 20 percent. So this seems to be a trend that is continuing over time. Even in the biotech industry, um, only 10 percent of the board seats are um, occupied by women. Again, let's figure out what's happening here. So there are some theories. Um, I couldn't say that these are scientific um, in nature, but at least we, we are observing this over time. There's an overt discrimination, of course, but that has gone down recently. Um, but you know, most importantly, unconscious biases still exist um, against women in leadership positions. And, um, and that's evident in the numbers of women hired for senior leadership positions. Women submit significantly fewer grants, which is really disturbing to me because that is where it all starts. Um, women have to submit more grant applications. Uh, then they can't complain they're not getting funding. And so 31% of the applications um, were by women versus 69%. And for NSF, 24% versus 76% for the males. So you know, women have to be more proactive and, and be more aggressive in submitting applications for their great work. Women are 10 to 20% less likely than men to become independent pr principal investigators, and they get um, less money, and they hesitate to apply for tenure track positions. Why is that? Well, some people think that it's because they have fewer role models of women in upper ranks in science and medicine. Again, why should that be? Uh, women ha can have role models in men. More women than men consider leaving their scientific and medical careers. Well, early on, there was a medical doctor by the name of Bridget Leventhal, uh, who was a colleague of ours uh, in, a, in another society, ASCO. And she was trying to figure out why women, after they went through the medical school training, they were dropping out. And she came to me one day and she said, Marge, I just can't figure it out. Someday we'll understand. It's not just work-life balance. It's not just one thing or another. Even single women are dropping out. So it is a, uh, these are issues that we need to face and figure out. And I think I would love to see us commission a study. So we need more definitive information on the nature of other reasons. And, and of course, the top reasons for men are job market issues and the choice of men for the wrong discipline. Not sure why men make the wrong decision about what they want to do, but that appears to be in the literature. So sadly, women lack confidence and underestimate their abilities. That really bothers me because they, this can have an adverse effect on their professional accomplishments. This lack of self-confidence has been cited in many studies and in many books written on the subject. Women have to have a spirit of competitiveness and a level of self-confidence um, because when it's lacking, um, it, it, it doesn't help you in one bit. And these, these traits, these, these um, passive traits are really um, not good. Um, you know, when women are, uh, don't have uh, the, um, uh, they don't have the wherewithal to really show what they can do, 
um, they're perceived as uh, basically not as good as men. So we have to be more careful and, and figure out uh, some of that. Gender diverse uh, disparities in the receipt of scientific awards would obviously follow from a lack of research funding. And these numbers um, of women getting um, uh, Nobel Prizes is pretty, you know, it's pretty abysmal. As of 2019, Nobel Prizes were given to 866 men and only 53 or 5.7% to women. Uh, a total of 20 women have won, a pri won, won these prizes in physiology or medicine, chemistry, and physics. Wow. Okay. So again, let's try to work together to understand why this is happening. Um, we need to look at who's on the Nobel Prize Committee. But I'll tell you very honestly, it's not just getting women on the Nobel Prize Committee to make those decisions, because as I'll point out later, women frequently do not support other women, okay? And the women in the room have to know this. They have to realize they themselves have a responsibility to their own gender. So what are the root causes of gender inequities? Well, lack of work-life balance. I just heard over the news uh, the other day, um, the uh, Todd Carmichael, who was a co-founder of La Colombe Coffee, and he, he was, he was uh, commenting on, there is no such thing as work-life balance. Um, in fact, if you love your work, it isn't work, and I've always felt that way about my own work, uh, but obviously um, it's all a personal decision. But, um, but work-life balance, I can tell you, if somebody cites that when they come to, um, uh, uh, for a job application at the ACR, they don't get the job. <laughs> because you don't know what that means. You, you, know, you, you really can't figure that out. Does that mean I want to work a half a day instead of a full day? What does that mean? So work-life balance has to be studied as well. Favoritism and subjectivity in hiring and advancement would be another reason. Um, networking opportunities are lacking. Uh, women joke how they you know, would like to go in, um, into um, the, um, the restrooms and have conversations with colleagues the way men do, okay? Um, well, I don't know if there's any, anything important happening there, but the, the, important, the important thing is that um, we need better networking opportunities and, and a better access to mentors, sponsors, and role models. More funding, uh, more objectivity um, in evaluating uh, performance, and an area that I'm particularly concerned about is inadequate leadership skills for everyone, men and women. But I can see it very frequently in our boards of directors. Women either don't say anything after they're elected, they sit there and don't ask any questions, or they ask too many questions and people go, oh, here she goes again, oy, okay. So you have to know when to hold them and when to fold them and to really show leadership skills really is to say, when can I make the most important point in the room and be heard? Uh, and of course, this, this lack of self-confidence and insecurity uh, is, a, is a, a, a consistent problem. Some of these issues can be mitigated by behavioral change um, on part of women as well as mentors, but again, study needs to be done. So there are international perspectives on this. As I said, in, in Europe and in, certainly in Asia, uh, things are more difficult for women. Uh, women are more likely to report that they're not taken seriously um, and, um, and their work does not receive the same respect as the, uh, that of their, their male counterparts. I think that's changing now, um, that's improving. Uh, but uh, making the transition to a leadership role really requires a lot of help along the way, and we need, women need advice and counsel. And the reality is that not everyone aspires to be a, in a leadership role. And that surprised me a bit because um, I've always thought that was the pinnacle of what we wanted to do in, you know, in our professional careers. But only 36% of men aspire to the C-suite and only 18% of the women. And, the, and again, the reasons for this difference are not really understood uh, or known. And uh, I assume it's sometimes, depending on one's personality, one's uh, um, uh, impression of one's own abilities, you make those decisions. There's a problem in biotech. Um, Biotech is very important today in the ad advancement of uh, biomedical science. And uh, less than 2% of the biotech startups are, are founded by women. Why is that? Well, I guess there's a certain fear or also a lack of understanding of what goes into it. So we need to encourage boards of directors to include more women. There's, a, there's um, an approach to try to include 25% of females uh, by 2022. 
Uh, this would create access to all kinds of understanding and, and background and experience that would help women, uh, educational opportunities, and also mini sabbaticals uh, that would bring them along to be able to get that 2% higher and, and, have, um, and have women have uh, visible leadership positions in biotech. This is changing. Um, Fortune Magazine's um, Most Powerful Women is issue this year is, is better than it was last year. In 2019, the number of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies did rise to a record uh, level of 36 vis-a-vis -vis prior years, but this really is only seven, about 7% seven of all CEO positions. And you can see in biopharma, female CEOs are at 8.3%, healthcare, um, female CEOs at 13%. So, you know, we have to work harder to figure, figure out what that is, but again, at least those numbers are going up even from last year, and it's um, exciting to see um, that that is happening and people are, women are being incorporated into leadership positions because why? It's just good business. So I, I have to say, um, my brother used to be the president of Mutual New York Insurance Company. And he was a bit of a chauvinist, I'm embarrassed to say to all of you. And, um, and I said to him one day, well, how many women are, are actually um, uh, in leadership positions in your company? He said, well, I have 10 SVPs and five are women. I said, wow, for you, that's a lot. And he said, and he said to me, uh, it's good business, sister. I said, oh, that's it, okay. And so it, if it's good business, let's do it, okay. We have a counterpart in, in, in Congress now showing that nearly 24% of the of United States Congress is, are women. And an exciting new initiative I wanted to mention that just got approved um, last month um, where there is now a congressional uh, women in STEM caucus in Congress, which is fantastic because they are really focusing on how to promote the role of women in science, looking at education of young girls, even legislation to help in, in a lot of these areas. So these advances are very important to the cause of helping women, and it's very exciting. So, you know, thinking about the uh, role of women in science and academia goes really, uh, as I said, a long way back. But in 1979, very famous guy by the name of Sir Peter Bryan Medawar said the following, the case for rejoicing in the increasing number of women who enter the learned professions has nothing primarily to do with providing them gainful employment or giving them an opportunity to develop their potential. It is above all the fact that the world is now such a complicated and rapidly changing place that it cannot even be kept going, let alone improved, without using the intelligence and the skill of approximately 50% of the human race. There's a Chinese proverb that says, women hold up half of the world. And that is uh, certainly uh, the case here. So again, <clears throat> bringing women into the fold. And it's even happening in Japan. So there was a very interesting article in 2013 a, a, a quote that from Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, who's still in office, who said, creating an environment in which women find it comfortable to work and, en and enhancing opportunities for women to work and to be active is no longer a matter of choice for Japan. It is instead a matter of the greatest urgency. Again, it comes down to a business decision. The article was named, you mean women have brains, question mark. So yes, we do, uh, by the way. So, so I think if it's happening in Japan and it's happening in other places, it can certainly happen in our own personal environment. So we, as we enter the, the labyrinth of leadership, we need uh, role models, great mentors, help us navigate through the complexities of, of this labyrinth and help us to see exactly how we can get where we need to go. Mentorship um, is, a, is a key ingredient of, success, of a successful scientific career, career for men and women and it plays a pivotal role in a professional advancement at every career stage. Usually, however, mentors are around for just a short period of time, two to, two to five years, and, and this um, progresses through a series of predictable phases in, in the relationship. Um, you would imagine that it's not only a subject matter expertise, but also increasingly psychosocial consulting and counseling, and it re really requires a lot of proactivity, accessibility, and a considerable investment of time on the part of the, the mentor and the, and the mentee. But I worry a bit about uh, how we are all so busy these days that we can't 
um, spend as much time as we would like. And I say in front of my colleague here, who is here from the AACR, uh, we had a conversation just yesterday, and I said, I really need to see you more. I need to sit with you more and talk about issues, important issues facing our organization. But you get so busy, and you really can't mentor as regularly as you would like. But, but you know, women mentees have, a, have particularly unique challenges in establishing relationships. There are higher hurdles to confront. There are, there's still overt discrimination. There are incom uh, incompatible work and personal styles and other relationship issues. We won't discuss the Me Too thing, but that is an issue that one has to face as well. So we have a, um, you know, we have to really work hard to get good mentors and keep them and treasure them. There are many, many good things that mentors can do um, and to be uh, accessible and supportive um, and coach and uh, provide specific uh, guidelines um, and measures of accomplishment and really motivate. I mean, I hope that my hard work is motivating to my colleagues at the AACR just by observing what I do and how I get um, things done. But again, you have to be uh, alert to that. We have to offer valuable networking opportunities, and I think that that's um, something that is very important, and, um, and obtain uh, internal and, and external, um, really, um, recognition from mentees. But I wanted to underscore something very important today, and that's the vital role of what we call sponsors. And sponsors are defined as the public support by a powerful, influential person for the advancement and promotion of an individual with within whom he or she sees untapped or unappreciated uh, um, leadership talent or potential. We can't get where we need to go without sponsors. And we don't, I think, and when I was much younger, I never thought of it. I had sponsors, but I didn't, I didn't realize they were sponsors. But now, looking at this definition, I realize I had several male sponsors helping me along the way, even as a very, very young person. And I'll show you their pictures in a moment. These sponsors act as advocates for individuals at key junctures. And I think, I think women and men need to find sponsors to be able to really work through the challenges in their careers. They differ from, sponsors differ from mentors in that they uh, are in positions of power and, um, and they can really help our careers. And they are especially needed to help support the career advancement of women. So because there are fewer women in senior ranks, many women needing sponsors go underserved. That's why male sponsors are very important and they have the, the potential to be career changing. Also, institutions have a very, very important role in, um, in addressing workplace gender in, uh, inequities. And I'm sure this institution is, is helpful in that regard. Recruiting an appropriate percentage of women, making sure that they're paid equally increasing networking opportunities and leadership training, doing all those things, training seminars, um, incorporating a sponsorship program that identifies um, and promotes women, and also something very important, making sure nominations um, of women for, uh, for prizes and awards are actually executed. We don't get enough um, nominations of women for our prize, and so therefore, we don't have a sufficient number of women getting awards. So that's very important, and institutions play a major role. And organizations, too, have to do the same, offer the same kinds of opportunities, and also form constituency groups to help. ACR has, uh, has done this for quite some time. I wanted to say that um, I'm very proud of the editor-in-chief for whom I work, Dr. Michael Shimkin, who was the, the uh, former NCI director, um, who really was a historian, in fact, and he wanted to, he was, a, he was the cover editor of, of Cancer Research, and uh, which is, is, is the, uh, probably it is, I know, the oldest can, uh, English language cancer journal in the world. We still publish it. And he wanted to do a, a, a cover on, um, on women. And so we, we put that together in 1975. Of course, he wanted it in pink, and I told him I think, didn't think that was a good idea. Uh, so we did it in blue. But the thing, the thing was that um, it turned out to be a f spectacular feature that everyone commented on for years to come. And, and we're, I'm very happy that we're now considered the gold standard. We formed a, a women in cancer research group actually within ACR in 1998. But in 1988, it was formed outside the ACR because the three women on the board 
on our board said it wasn't necessary to have a women's group. So again, women need to support other women. This council has done an enormous job, um, uh, really, in, in, in showcasing the, uh, the outstanding um, uh, work of, of women. And this woman in the middle, Bridget Leventhal, is the one I was saying, um, really was, was at that time um, trying to figure out what was going on. So 36 women were elected to the ACR board over a 44 year period, but 39 elected over the past uh, 18 years or so. And so we are picking up, we are increasing, and I'm proud to say that our membership has now grown from what was 14%, 17% in 1990, 30% in 2005, and now 44% of the membership is women. Board of Directors, 50%. Women presidents, significant. And committee chairs, 44%. So we are known worldwide now as the gold standard because if you look at these numbers, AACR comes out of uh, uh, really looking extremely good, having um, women leadership positions, 46.7%, whereas unfortunately, our radiation colleagues are only at down at seven percent. So every this was published, by the way, in ESMO Open, and every um, major society is now looking at these data and saying we got to get going here. We're not doing very well. But again, getting back to the grant applications and what what's happening with women. Look at these numbers. Women are simply not you know submitting the same number of grants as men are, and of course they're not getting it, except for some. Strange anomaly in 2016 where um, they, they really exceeded men in, in getting grants. In 2016, I thought that was amazing and we have to find out what's going on there. So as I said, I've been very fortunate to have a highly supportive uh, mentors and especially sponsors throughout my career. So let me just tell you firstly, Shimkin, Dr. Shimkin hired me at 20 years old. He said, why do you want to work here? You're going to have to work hard. I said, okay. He said, um, we're all eccentric academics. You sure you want to work? I said, I had already worked uh, for a couple of years at Penn. So I said, yeah, that's no problem. So I worked, I was 20 years old. I did not yet have my, uh, my bachelor's degree. He recommended me to Dr. Winehouse as the managing editor at age 24. Again, that sponsorship was there. Sidney Winehouse recommended me to Dr. Clarkson for the CEO position. And of course, these colleagues here were really uh, ongoing advisors. Again, women need male sponsors. And when women support each other, incredible things happen. You know, young women often don't get the kind of support they need from, uh, from their senior female colleagues. And when I look out in the room, I see women nodding their heads because they've had bad experiences. And, and they, th this is definitely needed. This mutual support of women is sorely needed. And I often think about the quote, from Madeleine Albright, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women, okay? We have to think about that. I myself have had three issues in my career, not big ones, all with women, okay? So, you know, we really need to help each other and avoid this male bashing that goes on frequently. So, 1933, uh, there was a, a, an essay in the Ladies' Home Journal that talked about women and the qualities of a woman leader, the vision to discover an avenue of progress, the courage to explore it, the determination and devotion, the magnetism to draw others along the path. Just an amazing quote, I thought, in 1933. And I think about this one a lot. And I also think about the role of women in the path to their own self-actualization. Stop complaining and help yourself. Tap into your talents, engage yourself in professional uh, societies. Rarely do I ever have a woman call me and say, I'd like to serve on a committee or be involved in a committee. Build a diverse network of mentors and sponsors and enjoy the opportunities to reciprocate and give help to other women. And again, make your own unique special mark on your career. So to summarize, the intellectual contributions of women scientists and physicians are really absolutely essential to the future of, of this field of biomedical science and medicine, and to the conquest of really the most challenging d diseases of our time, and I include cancer in that, um, in that, although obviously we have so many other, you have so many other things to think about. We know that the full potential of women has not yet been fully exploited. 
uh, for the benefit of patients and the greater integration of, of women at all career levels, whatever they wish, may wish to have, and in all areas of science and medicine, really has to be a high strategic uh, priority. And I'm glad that that caucus has been formed. I wondered, I, we have to look into it, it's just happened, but I, I need, we need to understand where that started and why it started and, and to kind of um, further embellish it. We need role models and mentors and sponsors, uh, both male and female, um, and they must be increased in number of, so as to catalyze uh, progress going forward. And on a broader level, national and international policies that emphasize the, the importance, the urgency, and I underscore urgency, and the, po the positive impact of gender equity uh, really must be instituted. I thought of two people I wanted to just close um, with here. One was uh, Sally Ride, we all know who she is, an amazing astronaut, who said, I would like to be remembered as someone who was not afraid to do what she wanted to do, and as someone who took risks along the way in order to achieve her goals. She also suggested taking the high road and have a little sense of humor and let things roll off your back. I think that, that I really resonate too, because obviously if you get yourself all shook up and you, you really will lose, um, you'll lose perspective and objectivity. So women have to just let these things roll off their back and stay centered in, in their approach to their careers. And of course, Sheryl Sandberg, many of you have read their, her book on Lean In. She talks about needing self-confidence, raising your hands, and really um, don't pull back when you should be leaning in. And I agree with all of those. So we have a bright future ahead for women in science and medicine. Um, I thought I'd show you a picture of um, the Roman goddess Victoria um, to really emphasize the future successes of women are really ensured provided there's a commitment at all levels, and that is every level, every institutional level, every personal level, to overcome the challenges and uh, to realize that women will leave an indelible mark on their special careers. And by working together, uh, I know we will be, become even more victorious than we are now in achieving the dream of, of, of gender equity toward, the, toward our goal of improving humankind, saving lives, helping um, to uh, save and, do, and find more cures for all human diseases. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate being here. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions if you have the time. And thanks again, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fodi. So I'd like to open up uh, for questions from the audience. Dr. Rivoli. So uh, thank you so much. That was great and uh, a wonderful summary and gives uh, us something to really think about. I, it certainly resonates with uh, some of the thoughts I've had throughout my career. Uh, an interesting thing happened recently in that uh, Goldman Sachs announced that they will not do business with any company that does not place a woman on their board. Okay, so they will uh, lose millions, perhaps billions of dollars in business through this action. Is this, do you view this as hype or a sincere effort to advance women? Well, I, I, I view this as a sincere effort. However, I must say that I'm not a fan of quotas. I think, um, you know, um, sometimes women come forward who are, who are somewhat militant and they'll say, I want, I th you think we should have 50% of this and 50% of that, and sometimes we can't really find uh, that, that percentage. I think it's, in this case, uh, certainly, women should be on boards of important companies. There's no question about it. That should happen organically. It should not be something that needs to be your role. But, uh, so I, I think it's good, um, and I hope that, that they can accomplish it. Um, but, um, you know, quotas are uh, often a problem. We, um, we also need to look at underrepresented minorities in, uh, in our, um, in our uh, desire to have diverse populations of individuals on various boards and other, and other uh, such um, uh, constructs. And I, I hope that that will be uh, possible, as I said, without having to make rules. I think when you have rules and you don't meet the rules, it becomes a problem and people, you know, um, get a little unhappy. So I'd like to see it happen um, without the rules, to be honest.
ERs during the prescription to address standard inequities in review of transportation? Well, to be honest, we haven't done anything. Um, um, there, there have been uh, cases where people have said, well, we should remove the names from, you know, from these applications so people don't know it's a woman or a, a man uh, submitting. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of controversy over whether that's really appropriate, uh, whether that's helpful and, and, and so on. I, when, when we look at the, uh, the data, and I, I didn't show one piece of data, it showed that uh, women fare very well in, in grant reviews. So I'm not sure what studies are being looked at. I think it's controversial, uh, but uh, we, should be very, we should be very careful and try to push forward. I, I can see that in National Cancer Institute, Women are um, uh, represented at the highest level, and they are watching this at, at the NIH and in, in the peer review system, but the, I don't think they have done anything along those lines either to uh, formally, formally. Again, I think uh, informally we should all be uh, trying to make sure that um, there is objectivity in everything. Uh, again, coming back to overt discrimination, I think it has gone down significantly. Um, I, uh, I think we have to watch for it, but I, I cannot imagine that it would be possible to have overt discrimination in the long term. Um, the men on the review teams would not, simply not allow it because there are too many angels trying to help women get, get uh, their grants today. So I, I, just, I just think uh, we have to be very careful to make rules that we cannot comply with. Yes, sir. Absolutely. We look at that very carefully. Um, well, you know, you can imagine as we're increasing the number of women presidents, they're looking at this. Again, trying not to hit a certain quota, but after we are proactive, uh, then you look back and you say, wow, I got 40%, 50%. In fact, I just asked that question because we're just about ready with the um, uh, uh, finalizing the meeting in April for San Diego. And, um, and we, we looked at uh, the number of women speaking, and it's uh, close to 50%. Um, again, it, it's, it's something you, a guide, you know, and it's something that we as organizations are working on. And of course, when you have, in, in our case, 44% um, of the members are women, 47% are in leadership positions, that's going to happen naturally. Um, and they can identify, the thing that, that is often uh, a problem is we don't often know who these people are. So if you have people recognizing, whether they're male or female, recognizing who should be put forward as, um, as a new star, um, women star, that's very helpful because in a field where we have 46,000 members and 150,000 people on our Non in our non-member database of women and men working in cancer research, it's hard to know everyone. So you need guidance, you need recommendations, and we, we encourage that. Yes, sir. I, I sincerely hope so. Um, I think there should be mutual trust across genders. And uh, that's why, you know, I think quotas are complicated. I, I really do hope so. And I think, again, we have to find the reasons for these obstacles. We have to, it's not just work-life balance. It's, you know, it's, it's so many other things that are, that are, that have to be uh, identified and worked on. And I, you know, maybe in the next 10 years we'll see a difference. I was very lucky. As I said, I was 20 years old. I was a kid and somebody said, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll help this person. Um, so I come back to needing, to en encouraging sponsors. We all, we all ought to function as a sponsor for at least one person or more in a, in a in concrete period. And maybe that will, maybe, maybe in the future we, um, we won't have to give such a talk. I'll, I'll be glad to come back and just listen to all of you speak about science and medicine at, in your seminars. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.